Soldiers and Croats, the struggle in Yugoslavia, in your preface, you say that you were led to write this book primarily by the realization that the journalism produced in the wake of the collapse of communist regimes in Eastern Europe, including Yugoslavia, has been not only inadequate, but often incorrect. Yes, that's correct. How incorrect? Well, for example, uh, so often you heard the statement made that uh, Versailles created Yugoslavia. Well, actually, the Yugoslavs created and, and the state was established before Versailles ever met. Uh, and there are other kinds of uh, things about, you know, they're referring to this present war, uh, the conflict in Yugoslavia as a civil war, as a, con as, a, as a war of aggression, whereas it really is a civil war. Let me just interrupt to ask you, what, when you refer to Versailles, what are you talking about? Well, the Versailles Peace Conference at the end of the First World War. Um, some columnists have said the Yugoslavia was sort of cobbled together out of remnants of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Well, actually, it was put together by uh, South Slavs, Serbs, Croats, Slovenes, many of whose intellectuals, uh, intellectual leaders had suggested that this was a uh, logical way to go. And actually, they concluded in July of 1917 uh, agreement on the formation of the new state. What does Yugoslavia mean? Well, Yug in uh, Serbian or Croatian means south. So it's, you know, a land of the South Slavs. What does Slav mean? Slav is a term uh, f uh, applied to the general um, configuration of races in Eastern Europe, uh, Russians, Belarusians, Ukrainians, Serbians, uh, Montenegrins, Croatians, Czechs, Slovaks. What's the name Dragnich? Dragnich really comes from uh, the, uh, well, uh, drag means deer, and it comes from, a, uh, from my forebears, uh, who, uh, whose uh, name was, the original forebear was uh, Draga, and his descendants became Dragniches. Where did they live? They lived in uh, what was uh, South Serbia at that time, and three brothers, as my father tells me, it told me a long time ago, three brothers who migrated to what is what Montenegro, and uh, there were these three brothers, uh, uh, Draga and Maro uh, and Chorovic, Choro, and so the, the the of the three brothers, the three lines, Dragnich, Chorovic, and Marovic. When did your family come to the United States? Well, my father came in 1907, and my mother in 1911. Actually, my father came here with the idea of making some money and then going back, buy some land, and then live like a king. I mean, it was that land hunger, you know, but my father moved from one job to another, clear across the continent, even up to Alaska, at which point my mother got rather tired and said, you know, either send money for me to come over there or come home. Well, he hadn't saved enough money to come home, so he sent for her to come, and then uh, she came in 1911. I was born in 1912, out in the state of Washington. Are you a Serb? Yeah, my father, yeah, my, my parents both came from, they're both Serbs from Mont Montenegro. How much of your uh, Serbian and, and ancestry uh, influenced your need to write this book? I don't think, uh, I don't think any, except to the extent that I uh, became rather familiar with the country and did my PhD dissertation on the development of parliamentary government in Serbia. Uh, so that I was a bit familiar, and then I served in the embassy, in the American embassy, in 1947 to 50. And so that familiarity with the country, I think, led me to, uh, to a familiarity with the book, because I wrote several other books uh, about Yugoslav history. When was Yugoslavia created? In 1918. Formal declaration, December 1st, 1918. We've got a map that we took out of your book. Uh, several, there are several maps in this book. Uh, this is the one of European powers, August 1914, that's there on the screen, that shows Germany and Austria-Hungary, and right below it would be Serbia? Serbia, yeah. And Montenegro? Montenegro. Romania, Bulgaria. Yes. Uh, uh -huh. What was the world like when that map was drawn? Well, that was a world in, in which uh, pre-World War I, uh, when Germany and uh, Austria-Hungary were, were allied together and Russia to one side there and France uh, were, and, and Britain, of course, part of the Triple Entente. The, the, two, uh, the two camps, so the two Ententes clashed in, 
in the First World War. What does Entente mean? Well, it means a, uh, an alliance. And when Yugoslavia was formed, who put it together? And how many different areas made it well, uh, whole? Serbia, uh, which uh, dates back to the Middle Ages, and was under then under Turkish uh, Ottoman rule for nearly 500 years, became independent in the 19th century. And so that plus Montenegro, another independent Serbian, small Serbian kingdom, uh, were involved in the First World War. And uh, during the war, uh, there was also something called the Yugoslav Committee, functioning uh, largely in London, uh, chaired by a Croatian, but there were Serbs and Slovenes on it too. These were people who represented the Serbs and the Croats and the Slovenes who were in part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And so they were eager, eager to get out from under the Austro-Hungarian Austro Empire and wanted to join Serbia to form a common country. If a Croat was sitting here next to you, what would he or she look like? Oh, probably couldn't tell the difference. <laughs> How about a Slovene? Uh, no, I, I doubt you could tell much difference. What about language? Language, if, you are in, if you're in Serbia, people will say Serbian. If you're in Croatia, they'll say Croatian. Uh, universities who teach the language uh, call it Serbo-Croatian. Actually, the differences between Serbian and Croatian are no greater than British English and American English. Slovene, uh, speak, they speak a tongue that is very, very similar, but uh, also some significant differences. Where does the word Balkan come from? Balkan uh, simply refers to, uh, well, I guess the, the word Balkan means mountain. And it was referred to, uh, the Balkans were referred to as a part of the, Austro uh, part of the Ottoman Empire when it was, uh, when the Ottomans, Ottoman, Ottoman Turks came in there in the um, 14th century, 15th century. Now, going back to your own history, uh, you say you were born in what town? A little town of Republic, which is, <laughs> which is uh, in the state of Washington, up north near the Canadian border in eastern Washington. How long did you live there? Well, until I went off to college at the age of 21. Where'd you go to college? I first went to a little Baptist school in, uh, in Oregon called Linfield College, mainly because I had two teachers who were graduates of Linfield. And then at the end of, uh, end of two years, uh, I was in debt a little, maybe $100, $150, which in those days was quite a bit. Stayed out a year, uh, worked, paid off that debt, and then decided that it would cost me less to transfer and to go to the University of Washington, where I uh, got my BA degree and also where I met my future wife. And what did, you, what did you get your degree in? In political science, major in political science. What did you do after school? Well, after school, I went to do graduate work at the University of California, uh, where I got an MA and a PhD. And I must uh, pay uh, considerable <laughs> thanks to my wife, who then was a registered nurse and who, in effect, helped me get through graduate school. This book, um, which is small in size, was written when? It was written, my, well, mainly in 92, but uh, part of, no, 91 and 92. I went out to try to find it in bookstores. It took me a long time. I finally found it in a bookstore up in New York City. How come it's so hard to get? I, I can't explain that because it's published by Harcourt Brace Ivanovich, which uh, a company has a wide uh, network of distribution. Let me ask you maybe a, a better question. How come this is the only book I could find in a, in a bookstore that had anything to do with Yugoslavia or Serbs and Croats? Well, I don't know. There isn't much in the uh, past. Uh, there is a, th a rather thin volume also published by a British young man uh, by the name of Glennie uh, who has done some, uh, some good work. But in, in general, why is it that uh, so little has been written? about that part of the world when we're so, at least emotionally, involved in talking about it these days? Well, I think some things were written about that part of the world, but they, they were written in somewhat earlier years. Uh, this one happened to, <laughs> to coincide rather conveniently with events uh, in Yugoslavia. Uh, I, at one point I said, well, uh, to my wife, I said, well, I ought to write a brief history about Yugoslavia because then it seemed like Yugoslavia was, was on the way to breaking up. And I thought, well, a brief uh, history, uh, you know, my other books uh, dealt with the development of parliamentary government in, in Serbia or Nikola Pašić, Yugoslavia uh, and Serbia. 
and uh, other books that I've done, you know, were sort of scholarly books with a lot of footnotes and so on. I thought here, I, I really attempted here to do a popular history that would be uh, easily understood by any reader, and I wanted to keep it fairly brief. You often read that World War I started in Sarajevo. Where is Sarajevo, and did it start there? Sarajevo is, uh, as everybody knows, I think now, in the center of, of what is called Bosnia-Herzegovina. It was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire at that time. It was part of the Ottoman Empire, and uh, the, as the Ottoman Empire was, was sort of decaying, uh, in 1878, Austro-Hungary was allowed to occupy um, Bosnia-Herzegovina, and then unilaterally uh, they annexed it in 1908. And that became the uh, <clears throat> sort of the focal point uh, for a lot of Serbs who, who were at that time the largest group in that area that we now call Bosnia-Herzegovina. And it was there that the, uh, that the Austro-Hungarian pretender to the throne, or the the heir to the throne, rather, uh, and his wife came, and unfortunately they came at a, on what is Vidovdan, the holiest of Serbian holidays. Uh, Serbian authorities had uh, nothing to do with it, although there was a, uh, a movement called uh, Young Bosnia, and it was uh, a member of that uh, movement that actually uh, killed uh, the heir to the throne and his wife in in 1914. The heir's name? Uh, Ferdinand. And what happened Archduke that? Ferdinand. Who, when, when he was killed, what happened then? Well, uh, Austria-Hungary uh, issued an ultimatum to Serbia uh, to uh, allow Serbia, to allow Austria-Hungary to come into these lands and into Serbia to uh, ferret out anti-Austro-Hungarian uh, activities. Uh, I think Serbia uh, agreed to every, I don't remember now the, all of the details, but I think Serbia agreed to practically all of the uh, terms of that ultimatum except this one to allow uh, a foreign, foreigners to come into Serbia to meddle in Serbian affairs and at that point uh, Austro-Hungary simply declared war on Serbia. What is the correct pronunciation of Bosnia slash Herzegovina? Or Herzegovina, Herzegovina. Bos Bosnia, Herzegovina. If you say, we, we, we hear people pronouncing it two ways, Herzegovina or Herzegovina, which one's Herzegovina. Right? Herzegovina. On, in most of these words that, uh, that are Serbian or Croat, the accent is usually on the first syllable. You have in the front of this book uh, a little... Guide to pronunciation. Gu guide to pronunciation, which will show the audience. And uh, yes. wh why did you do that? Well, because uh, I think in many books, uh, and particularly on the newspapers, uh, some of the, uh, the sounds don't come out right unless you see what, uh, how, the, how it is written in the language with the diacritical marks over some of these letters, like uh, C, for example, or if you look at one of these um, current leaders, uh, Milosevic in Serbia, when it's written, when you see it in the newspapers, it's, it ends with a C, but actually it is pronounced as if it were CH. Do you find people mispronouncing your name very often? Uh, they have, yes. <laughs> Mr. Dragnish, can you go back to that, the hyphenated Bosnia-Herzegovina and explain why it, and what that is? Well, uh, there were two areas there. One was called Bosnia and the other Herzegovina. And they don't have, they're just sort of geographic units. They have no ethnic uh, meaning at all. Uh, and if you were to go there, you couldn't tell the difference between a Serb and a Croat or somebody who was of a Muslim faith. Why has this become the uh, contested area? Well, it's become a contested area because uh, when Yugoslavia began to break up, the uh, large Serbian population did not want to be left outside because Serbia had fought in the Balkan Wars and in World War I to liberate those areas. And they became part of the of Serbia, or rather became part of the first Yugoslav state. When you say Balkan Wars, what, what, I mean, what are Balkan those? The Balkan War of 1912, which uh, in effect ousted the Turks from Europe, from the, from the area uh, that was, uh, well it was a combination of, of uh, several armies, Serbian, Bulgarian, Romanian, and Greek, that finally got together and said, look, this, uh, this decaying empire, we, we need to get, kick the remnants of it out of Europe, and they did in the Balkan War of 1912. 
one of the reasons we asked you to come here and do this book, um, and by the way, this, you said this book came out in 92, uh, and we were talking earlier about how difficult it is to get. I know you told us before this started that it's going to come out in paperback. It's going to come out in paperback in May, according to the publisher. Was there a reason? I mean, is there enough interest? Is that? Well, apparently there's enough interest because this, was, uh, this came out in 92, and the publisher tells me that uh, all copies have been distributed. Now, I suspect there are copies available in bookstores uh, here and there that have handled it. But uh, they decided not to print any more hardback, but to go to paperback. As I started to say, one of the reasons that we asked you to come here is to try to make sense out of all this. And, and maybe it's me, but I would ask you, do uh, other people have trouble understanding how to figure out this whole area? Oh, yes. Uh, <clears throat> many people have asked me, uh, many of my neighbors have asked me, you know, what is all the fighting about? And uh, many, many, of course, don't even understand. No, no, none of that history. And you cannot understand what's happening there unless you know some history of the, of the area and the peoples who are there. We've got in the back, uh, and I did some figuring there, it may not be exactly accurate, but I, you, you've got an exhibit in the back. I'll try to find it here. Well, we'll show it, put it on the screen and we can show what it looks like in the book. But you show some of the population breakdowns, and it, uh, it, I know it helped me understand a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Why don't we go ahead and yeah. put that on the screen? There you can see the Yugoslav population in 1991. First of all, where are these, what's the source of these figures? This, that's the uh, Yugoslav census of 1991. And the, uh, uh, and the figure looks a little bit, I, I didn't add it up the way you've got it there, uh, but uh, it, uh, it could be a little, a little large, I don't, I don't know. I mean, most of the time you see figures of, of 24 million instead 24, of 27. 24, 25, yes. Uh, that's my arithmetic, so somebody may take a pen to that yeah, and see it's wrong. Yeah. But if you go from the bottom, we'll go back to the other one in a moment. Bulgars, Romanians, Turks, gypsies. Now, what's a gypsy? Gypsies were people who uh, came uh, from somewhere in Asia and into the Balkans, and you find them in uh, you find them in uh, uh, Romania more more in Romania than any place else, but if, but some in in uh, Yugoslavia, some in uh, Hungary, some in um, in Czechoslovakia. And what's some. A, what's a Yugoslav? A Yugoslav is a uh, somewhat of, of the Slav race who is uh, in the south. That is, it, it's a sort of distinction between the northern Slavs or the Russian Slavs or those who are in, uh, let's say, the northern Slavs, the Poles, and then you've got some in Czechoslovakia or what, Slovakia and, and, and uh, the Czech Republic, uh, sort of middle of Europe, and then when you get down to the Balkans, it's, it's primarily uh, the South Slavs. In your book, and uh, James can look at this closely, you, you have this uh, appendix back here, it's where I got all these figures, population of Yugoslavia. One of the things I notice as you go down, go down slowly if you don't mind, please, uh, yes. that Serbs, in every section, there are Serbs. It's the only nationality that there is in each section. You can see there. Well, why is that? It isn't a complete breakdown. For example, there are some, uh, there are quite a few Serbs in, uh, quite a few Croats in Serbia, for example. And uh, so it does vary, but uh, Serbia, the Serbs are the most numerous. They were, I think, before the current fighting broke out, I think the Serbs made up about 38% mm, of the total population. But the one thing you notice, though, is that no matter what section it is, there are, there are Serbs in each one, but there aren't Croats or Slovenes in each section. Well, Why is that? It, isn't a it isn't a complete breakdown. I think the, uh, the chart itself may have been a little bit uh, skewed in that I, I took the major points there, but no, there are... There are uh, uh, Croats and there are Slovenes uh, elsewhere in, in the country. Let me ask you a general question about all that. Are you surprised by what's happened? Uh, to a degree, yes. Uh, I know that there, was some, there were some disagreements. I'm surprised that uh, some more peaceful resolution couldn't have been, uh, couldn't have been reached. And uh, as you no doubt have looked in the book, I blame uh, Western powers a great deal for what has happened. Why? Because they first recognized uh, Slovenia <coughs> and Croatia, this, this, this rather rapid recognition of the secessionist republics. And when they did that, they in effect aided and abetted the, the Croats and the Slovenes in the violation of the Helsinki Accords, which we signed, among, and practically all the European powers, 
the boundaries of countries could not be changed by force. And here these people were changing the boundaries of a sovereign nation, Yugoslavia. And, and the Germans and the Austrians pushed the hardest to do that. <clears throat> and then after, in effect, violating the Helsinki Accords against changing boundaries by force, they turn right around and say to the Serbs, but you can't do anything to rectify your grievances. In other words, <clears throat> there, are, there are many Serbs left outside the Republic of Serbia. I suppose to clarify that, before communism came to power in 1946, uh, the country was not divided into ethnic units, republics or, or anything else. But when Tito, who was the <coughs> leader of the, of the Yugoslav communists, came to power in 1946, he divided the country up into six republics and two autonomous provinces. Now, that was a rather artificial division <coughs> because it left a lot of Serbs outside the Republic of Serbia. And so, well, it le I said a lot. It left, out, uh, left close to three million. Uh, mo most of these, a million and a half in Bosnia Herzegovina, and six or six hundred or maybe eight hundred thousand in Croatia. We've got another map from 1941. We're going to show the audience from yes. your book. <clears throat> what uh, what what does this do? Partition of Yugoslavia. Who did the partitioning? Partitioning Yugoslavia was attacked <clears throat> by Italy and Germany in April of 1941, and <clears throat> a uh, satellite state was created. Uh, that was called the independent state of Croatia uh, and it reached to <coughs> take in most of Bosnia-Herzegovina and that particular division <coughs> was rather tragic in the sense that <coughs> three quarters of a million Serbs were massacred <coughs> in that uh, Axis satellite fascist uh, conglomeration called the independent state of Croatia uh <coughs> and uh, the rest of the country Part of it in the dark color up there indicating Slovenia and the dark color indicating mainly of Serbia. They became <clears throat> simply occupied by the Germans. Uh, and, uh, of course, that, that whole thing changed after, uh, at the end of World War II. You mentioned Tito. <clears throat> yes. Marshal Tito. We used to hear about him all the time. Yes. What's the name Walter have to do with this? He's Walter was his uh, <clears throat> Walter was his name uh, in the international communist movement. I guess the Russians gave him that name, and that's what he was known in the international communist movement as until uh, the war, uh, until World War II, and then uh, with the attempt of the Yugoslav communists to seize power in what was what had been Yugoslavia, then he came to be known as as Josip Broz Tito. Presumably, his real name was Josip Broz. He was uh, had a Croatian, Croatian father and a Slovene mother. Did he consider himself a Croat or a Slovene? Or no, a he he always said that he was <clears throat> that he was a Yugoslav. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, he made quite a point of that, saying that he was he was not uh, any of any one national group. Although, when it came to carving up the country and dividing it, uh, at one point he said. Uh, you cannot, <laughs> you cannot divide my my Croatia, so that he did have some uh, some feeling of, of nationality feeling. Although basically, he always said, "I'm a Yugoslav." When did you first go to that part of the world? Well, I went there in 1939 as a graduate student. Uh, I went to Europe for a couple of months. Uh, I was then uh, hoping to get a fellowship to do graduate work at the University of California in Berkeley, and I think. I felt some foreign experience like that would help me, which it did. I got a teaching fellowship at the University of California in Berkeley. So I was there in, in 39 for about a month within Yugoslavia. How long have you spent over there altogether? Well, uh, it's difficult for me to conclude because at the end of World War II, I was asked if I would go to Yugoslavia to be in the American Embassy in Belgrade, to be in charge of the uh, press and cultural work. And I was... Uh, there two and a half years and then I came then I came back to the United States went into teaching at Vanderbilt University in Nashville Tennessee and uh, then several summers I spent over there doing research uh, my first book called Tito's Promised Land came out in 1954 and then I did a book uh, later on uh, the <coughs> leader of Serbia Nikola Pasic who was uh, on the political stage in Serbia for about 50 years. He was the leading light in the uh, creation of Yugoslavia uh, from, from, from Serbia. 
and was Prime Minister of Serbia and then Prime Minister of Yugoslavia until 1926, the, death, the date of his death. Did you ever meet Marshal Tito? No, but I uh, saw him several times while I, was in, while I was serving in the American Embassy. How long was he the, the dictator that ran the country of Yugoslavia? Well, from uh, 1946, uh, officially, until his death in 1980. What did you think of him? Well, he, was, uh, he had some of the attributes of seeking integration of the country, but his basic policies really were uh, of, uh, of great ill for the country as a whole. We used to think, at least you'd read in American newspapers, that he was a friend of the West. Well, he, <clears throat> I don't think he was ever a friend of the West. He was a, he was a communist. He was a loyal uh, supporter of the international communist movement. Of course, when Stalin tried to <coughs> oust him in 1948, uh, he then uh, asserted himself as being independent. And we felt at that time, and incidentally, I was serving in the American embassy at that time, we felt that this was the uh, beginning of the downfall of communism. And we thought Tito had sort of kicked out the first brick from under that edifice. Uh, so, and then, of course, American newspapers uh, liked that idea, you know, of signifying a, somebody who was, uh, who was going to be uh, a great pin in the whole structure, uh, helping to tear it down. Uh, actually, uh, he, he buried some, in the, in the dictatorship, it was a dictatorship, it was uh, brutal, in the, especially in the initial years, and he felt that, <coughs> that somehow, he was putting this country together in a solid form. Actually, what he did was to sweep many of the critical problems, especially nationality problems, under the rug. And so when communism broke out, when, it, when rather communism uh, began to disintegrate, all of these hostilities that had been uh, churning under the, under the surface broke out in, in some of this uh, tragic uh, uh, war. What year did he die? 1980. What happened after that? Uh, after that, he was, he con, con, well, uh, before his death, in anticipation, I guess, of his death, uh, he put together a new constitution in 1974, which uh, shared power so that actually you needed almost unanimous consent among the republics before major uh, measures could be taken. But the Communist Party supposedly uh, was dedicated, certainly they said they were dedicated to carrying out his uh, following his path, <clears throat> but <clears throat> later on, uh, the leaders sort of began splitting and moved away uh, and following nation followed nationalist paths until uh, about 1989, 90, when when the break seemed to when the, when they when the whole business seemed to come unstuck. You, you, you criticize the Western governments for recognizing the breakup and uh, recognizing Slovenia and Croatia uh, too soon. Was that, did that include the Americans? Well, the Americans came later. Actually, uh, Secretary of Baker, uh, Secretary of State Baker, I think was on a sound course when he said to them, look, we'd rather you stick together, but if you're, not, if you're, gonna, go, if you're gonna fall apart, we will respect your wishes, and when you reach some political settlements, then we'll take up the question of recognition which was a very sound position. But pushed by Germany and Austria and some of the other Western European powers, we sort of caved in and uh, after a few months, we also recognized these, these states. Here's a map you've got from your book from 1945, which was, I assume, after World War II, you can see there. Um, if you go through those, those uh, sections of what was Yugoslavia, uh, Slovenia, Croatia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, uh, also Serbia and Macedonia, Montenegro. Who were they aligned with during World War II? Well, uh, Yugoslavia entered the war after being attacked by Germany and Italy in April of 1941. Uh, Yugoslavia became <coughs> part of the Western Alliance, but they were overwhelmed by uh, German and Italian troops in a short while, about two weeks. Then was created the, uh, the, the uh, independent state of Croatia, which was a Nazi fascist ally, which occupied most of Croatia and what is <coughs> Bosnia-Herzegovina. The rest of the country pretty well, well, Italy got some 
<clears throat> got to occupy some areas and Bulgaria some others uh, so that actually uh, and actually Croatia declared war on the United on the United States and on uh, on Russia <clears throat> or Soviet Union so that uh, the only people who really fought <clears throat> on the side of the Allies were the Serbs although of course you had two two guerrilla movements that were struggling <clears throat> for power and control and these two guerrilla movements uh, clashed with the communist movement coming out ahead, partly because of Western aid and partly because of Soviet aid. What's that part of the world like to go there and visit? Well, it was a great place to visit. I, I traveled over uh, most of Yugoslavia, and the people were very friendly. Whether you were talking to Serbs or Croats or Slovenes, uh, Macedonians, whatever you, they were, they were always very friendly to Americans. They looked up to America. Uh, Serbs, especially, had been allied uh, with the West. They had been friends of the United States uh, since uh, recognition back in, uh, I think it was 1878, for over a hundred years. And uh, the Serbs were allies of the West in two world wars. But uh, I don't want to minimize uh, the friendship of the other peoples of Yugoslavia who always, I think most Americans, found uh, all of the Yugoslavs, all the South Slavs, uh, very cordial and very hospitable. We uh, read that the Americans have a special relationship with Kosovo, or they, at least they have a position they're taking, that if certain things happen in Kosovo, we would intervene or we wouldn't permit things to happen. Can you explain that? Who lives there, by the way? Well, that's a tragic situation. That's the, <clears throat> and I, I'm glad you asked that because I think this is something that Americans generally don't understand. Kosovo is the region of South, and what was South Serbia. That was the center of the old uh, <clears throat> Serbian Empire of the Middle Ages. It was uh, the Serbia in those years, for about a hundred years, Serbia was the strongest empire in the Balkans. And so when you talk about Kosovo, that's where the basic, that's where all the, the cultural religious monuments, the Serbian Orthodox Church, for example, had all the monasteries there and so on uh, and the Serbs were the were the only ones there actually but in the close to 500 years of uh, Ottoman Turkish occupation the number of Serbs the percentage of Serbs dropped and of course it's a complicated uh, complicated questions but uh, the Serbs really I mean you talk about ethnic cleansing the Serbs were victims of it back in the 19th century uh, but uh, in Kosovo, that region, which is uh, sacred to the Serbs, just as uh, Jerusalem is to the Jews. Uh, so, but now, after World War II, Tito promised uh, these, uh, these Albanians who had uh, mainly uh, become a factor in the 19th century, uh, after they had converted to Islam, and then, <clears throat> with the coming of the Second World War, there was the uh, there were the Italians who uh, helped uh, create a greater Albania so the Kosovo became part of that greater Albania then after the war <clears throat> or during the war Tito had promised these Kosovo Albanians uh, freedom you know self-determination uh, when the war was over <clears throat> he didn't get quite give them that but he gave them a separate status within Serbia an autonomous region and after, in, in, under Tito, and these were, these were communists, in the uh, rule of Kosovo, uh, they had really uh, purged a lot of Kosovo. Not only did they destroy Serbian cultural monuments, desecrate uh, monasteries and cemeteries, but forced a lot of Serbs to flee, stole their properties, uh, burnt haystacks, and the like. And so that many Serbs fled. So to, today you have a situation where uh, the Albanian population is close to 90 percent of the Serbian population, 10 or 12 percent. And so uh, when this, uh, finally, it, after Tito's death, it became evident to a lot of people in, uh, in the central government in Yugoslavia, it was probably evident to them before, but nothing was done about this uh, um, persecution of Serbs in Kosovo by the Albanians. Then, then they simply uh, went ahead and, and uh, in, in, uh, under the, when Slobodan Milosevic became president of the Serbian party, Communist Party, it was then that he began taking on the, uh, the issue of Kosovo and made it his own campaign 
a promise which earned him a good deal of respect even among non-communists. What do you think of him? Well, he's a, he's a, he's a tragic figure. He's uh, for for the Serbs, he is, uh, he is bad medicine because he is not a Democrat. Uh, the Serbs historically have been great believers in democracy and tolerance. Serbs succeeded so that in, in the building of a parliamentary democracy before the First World War that was on par with any country in Europe with a free press, multiple parties, Governments fell uh, as a result of votes in the parliament and so on. It was, a, it, was a, it was a parliamentary democracy in the best tradition. And Milosevic is anything but that. He is part of the Tito, he's a, he's a part of the Tito heritage, part of that Communist Party, which uh, because of, the, uh, of, of, of his unwillingness, I think, to, to bend, uh, has been tragic for the Serbs and tragic for everybody over there. And his actual job today is what? Well, he's president of Serbia. And what is Yugoslavia today? You point out in your book there are three Yugoslavias. Yeah, that's the right. The first one was when? The first one in 1918 until it was <coughs> destroyed by the Nazi and Italians. What year was it destroyed? In 1941. The second <coughs> Yugoslavia came? It came at the end of the, first, end of the Second World War and stayed until it began to unravel in 1990. And the third Yugoslavia? The third Yugoslavia was created within the last couple of years, and it really consists of Serbia and Montenegro. And who runs that? Well, there is a, uh, there is a, a national parliament, and there is a national president. The, uh, the president is Dobrica Ćosic, who uh, is a Serbian novelist, uh, one-time communist. Uh, I, know, I know Ćosic rather well, and he is... Uh, he, he is now, uh, at least the, in the popular parlance, he is now a strong Serbian nationalist. Now, I, in my talks with, uh, with him over the years, because I got to know him when I was writing about the, uh, about the first Yugoslavia, and in those years, uh, he really was saying to me, you know, unless we can democratize communism, it's finish. finished. This was back in the 19, 1980, for example. You know, so he's technically the president, but everybody seems to believe that since Serbia is the largest component of that Yugoslavia, that Milosevic is the real, the real ruler. You have in your book figures, um, and I'm not sure where they are, but I was looking for them, figures of what the per capita income is for the Croats, the Slovenes, and the Serbs. Yes. And if I remember right, the Slovenes are something like $12,000 a year. Yes. The Croats were... What, in the age of seven or eight? Seven or eight. And, was, and the Serbs are 4,500. 4, that's right. Now, why the disparity? Well, part of the disparity, <clears throat> it's interesting because uh, the Slovenes and Croats have many times charged the Serbs with exploiting the, them and exploiting the country that they're contributing so much to the, uh, to the national product and so on. But I think what explains it is that historically, Slovenia and Croatia, as part of the Austrian Empire, was more advanced. Serbia was more uh, more rural, more uh, more backward. So that when <coughs> when the first Yugoslavia was created in the 1920s, when it came to the question of where do we invest money, well, you invested where there was some industry already, and that was Slovenia and Croatia. Uh, and it, ironically, Tito did the same thing after World War II. More of the investment went into Croatia and Slovenia in terms of uh, industrial, uh, industrial goods and industrial development. What about religion? Slovenes, Croats, and Serbians, what religion are they? Uh, Slovenes and Croats are uh, predominantly Catholic, almost entirely Roman Catholic. Serbs are uh, Serbian Orthodox. You know, Serbian Orthodox uh, Church is, is like other Orthodox churches, whether it's Greek Orthodox or Bulgarian Orthodox or Romanian Orthodox, Russian Orthodox. Uh, they are separate. They, they, have, uh, they have more autonomy than Catholic churches. I don't know whether you can do this or not, but if you had a Croat, a Serbian, and a Slovene sitting around a table, and they were going to tell each other what they really thought of each other, what would one say about the other? What are the kind of things that are underneath all this, the hatred that's involved in this? Well, I th <laughs> interestingly enough, you know, I've sat at tables at cafes where uh, all three were present and generally very cordial. Uh, I, I, I think they'd probably resist telling, <laughs> telling each other some of their basic, basic thoughts. Uh, 
uh, the Croats might say to the Serb, look, you're, uh, you're backward, you're Balkan, you're, you've been influenced by the Turks. Uh, the Serb may turn around and say to the Croat, look, you're a victim of the propaganda that comes out of the Vatican. And, uh, but if you're looking at them, you can't tell the difference. I can't, I can't tell the difference. And many of the, and well, let me just pursue that a little bit more. What would the yeah. Slovenes say? Anything different about the Croat and then Slovene about the Serbs? Slovenes would, Slovene would say, look, uh, both the Serbs and Croats, both you Serbs and Croats uh, are really not as developed as we are. I know the first time I took a trip through Slovenia and came uh, to Belgrade at a cocktail party, uh, some people were asking me what was my impression. I said, well, if I were a Slovene, I would, I would say I want to get out of this thing because actually the Croats and when you look at Croatia and, and Serbia, they're very similar, you know. Slovenes are more advanced. They had been more under the influence of the Germans. Uh, you found greater order and, uh, and greater cleanliness uh, all around. Slovenia was simply more advanced. Let me to pursue this a little bit more. Are, are, all, are the Slovenes, the Croats, and, and the Serbians all Caucasians? Yes. How about the Albanians? Uh, yes, I, I, I would say, but there are a lot of uh, anthropologists. I'm not an anthropologist, so anthropologists may be a little bit uh, view things differently, but they are basically Caucasian. Yes. What about the Muslims? Well, Muslims are, uh, depends on what, uh, wh wh which Muslims you're talking about. Uh, the Albanians are Muslims. And you talk about Muslims in Bosnia and Herzegovina, they're totally different. They're Slavs. They are Serbs, and they were Serbs or Croats, mainly Serb, who during the long years of Turkish occupation converted to Islam. So you're in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, when you're talking about the Muslims there, they are Serbs or Croats, or were Serbs or Croats, whereas in Albania they are, they are somewhat different. Is there any place in this area where the hatred is around the race issue, around the skin color differences? Uh, not, not really. Not really, because skin color is, is pretty much the same. All right, now you're... In some areas, there's a, there's a, these people lived side by side in great, great peace and, and, uh, and great accommodation. Other places, a little more hostility. By the way, uh, you said you taught at Vanderbilt. How long were you there? Oh, I was there 28 years. Where do you live now? Live in a, in a retirement community here on the outskirts of Washington, D.C. You have family? Yes, I have a wife, and I have a daughter who is married and lives in New York, uh, and I have a son who's in the Foreign Service, uh, currently stationed in Australia. When you sit around the table with friends now and they ask you about this area, what do you advise them? How do you, what do you suggest to them that they look for in trying to understand what's going on over there? Well, I tell them, look, uh, take a look at the history of, this, of these peoples and go back and try to see what happened when Yugoslavia started to break apart. It was uh, <coughs> strongly held together by the communist dictatorship under Tito and then after Tito for a number of years. But as the economy began to have problems, uh, they had borrowed a good deal of money in the United States and in the West generally with a huge foreign debt <coughs> and their e economy, like other communist economies, not too profitable, not too effective, not too efficient. Then they began blaming each other. And as, as, uh, as things ba began to break up, then I, I urged my friends, look, take a look at what was there before these people started breaking up. And then you'll sort of understand it, particularly if you look at, <coughs> at the lack of even-handedness on the part of the West in, uh, in trying to deal with these, these peoples after Yugoslavia started to break apart. When you're trying to find information today about that area, what do you watch and read? Well, I, <laughs> I, read, a new, I read newspapers. I get stuff from uh, English publications. I get some things out of Yugoslavia. Uh, and a lot of it you don't know because <clears throat> you don't know where the truth is. Uh, I have been uh, greatly uh, disappointed in the American media, for example. The demonization of Serbia, it seems that, that if you read everything you read, whether you read Los Angeles Times, New York Times, Washington Times, Washington Post, you get almost the same thing and everybody is blaming the Serbs. Whereas I think if you take a look at what happened when Yugoslavia was falling apart and see that <clears throat> the West was not even-handed, it, it favored the, the secessionist republics and not, and not the Serbs. Now the Serbs, 
It seems to me that the West might very well have gone, Western leaders might have well gone to the Serbs. Look, uh, they might have said, look, oh, these people are, are breaking apart. And, you know, Croatia has a right. If they want, if the Croats want to cc and want to form their own nation, that's okay. Slovenia wants to do that, that's all right. But then you ought to give the Serbs the same right of self-determination, which the, which the Western powers, in effect, foreclosed for Serbia. And that's why the Serbs did not want to live in, in Croatia, because of the experience of Croats during the, uh, that, neo -fa that fascist state in World War II. And the Serbs didn't want to live in a Bosnian state, because uh, the Serb Serbs had fought for the liberation of those Serbs so that they could join Serbia. Now, if they don't have the right to self-determination, then these Serbs began to fight. And I, I think if, if the West had simply said to the Serbs, look, when this thing is all over with, your grievances, we will support the addressing of your grievances in any final settlement. I think a lot of the bloodshed, maybe most of the bloodshed, could have been spared. On the back of your book, um, there's a praise for your book from the following people. Jim <coughs> Moody, Moody, from Wisconsin, a Democrat who used to be a member of Congress. Birch Bayh, a Democrat, <coughs> former senator from uh, Indiana. John Scanlon, former U.S. ambassador to Yugoslavia. And John Walke, professor emeritus of political science at the University of Arizona. Any reason why those particular people were picked to be on the back? Uh, well, I, let me say, uh, Moody had served, in, Moody had been in Yugoslavia before he was elected to Congress. He was with CARE, I think, uh, the, the organization providing uh, packages and so on of care and Moody traveled all over the country learned the language very well I've, I've heard him speak and uh, had a very even-handed <coughs> a very even-handed approach toward Serbs, Croats and Slovenes uh, I, I got to know him partly because of uh, the things that he said and then if you look at former ambassador Scanlon uh, I, I came to know him when I invited him first to speak to a group after he had returned as ambassador. Uh, I think that was in 80, uh, <clears throat> 88 or 89, after he had served as ambassador. And then I had a chance to see him after that at different, uh, different functions. And uh, I suppose it's quite normal that, uh, that here is a man who is, has no ethnic roots as far as Yugoslavia is concerned. What about Birch Bayh? Birch Bay, I think, was uh, simply working with, I think his law firm had a, um, uh, I think had an account with uh, Yugoslav Petroleum at one point. So that was his, uh, his interest, so he had some interest there. And I, I think, uh, let me say something more about John Scanlon, the ambas American ambassador. I suppose one reason, uh, I, I asked him to read the manuscript and he liked it. And uh, I suppose because, because he felt my uh, treatment of the subject was good, of course, that's, that, that appealed to me. John Walkie is an old friend of mine. We were colleagues together at, in political science at uh, Vanderbilt. Subsequently, he was president of the American Political Science Association, uh, went to uh, University of Arizona, where he, uh, I think, just retired recently. You can correct me on this, if you would, please, uh, if I'm wrong, but Lawrence Silverman, who is a judge, a federal judge here in town on the Court of Appeals, U.S. District of Columbia, yeah. Court of, District of Columbia uh, Court of Appeals, uh, was the ambassador to Yugoslavia during the Nixon administration, yeah. I believe. Yeah. Lawrence Eagleburger, more recently, was the ambassador to Yugoslavia, but he also ended up being Secretary of State in the Bush administration. When you watch those two men over the years, um, is there any conclusion you can make to the way they were ambassadors? Uh, and why did Larry Eagleburger say what he said when he was Secretary of State? Did it have anything to do with his experience there? Well, I think if we look at uh, if, you, if you look at Judge Silverman first, uh, he I think very correctly evaluated the uh, the ill nature of the communist regime, and he was certainly hated by the Yugoslav communists because he, I think he quickly uh, sensed the nature of that <coughs> the the autocratic nature of that regime. Uh, Eagleburger came to, I think, know the country pretty well. Now he had, after, uh, in the interim, between amb being ambassador there and becoming, uh, coming back in the State Department for a period of years, he was associated with uh, a Yugoslav venture, the um, 
the Yugo automobile, which was imported at one time to the United States and was charged with being <coughs> somewhat prejudiced by that. Uh, Eagleberger is interesting because one of the things he said to a, um, was uh, certainly quoted in the Baltimore Sun as having said, yes, we made a mistake in recognizing Bosnia-Herzegovina. We should not have done it until the question of the Yugoslav army had been resolved. Uh, later on, uh, I can't understand some of his statements because uh, he, knows, uh, he knows better than some of the things that he said. But I think he got very impatient because he was eager to have some resolution of that conflict. Uh, <laughs> is there any one place where people watching this can go on a daily basis to get the truth or close to the truth in any of the publications that you read? Uh, in your opinion? Well, <laughs> that, that's very difficult. Now, I think if you read some British publications, you can come closer to the truth. If you read The Independent, but, which is a very good uh, newspaper in Britain, or even some of the other publications. Uh, we, can, we can buy here in this country The Economist every week. You can also buy The Financial Times. What about those two? Well, I think Financial Times is not bad at all on, that, on, on Yugoslavia. Uh, the Economist has had some good articles and some rather um, not, not so good articles. Uh, I don't know. I used to admire the New York Times. I used to admire the Washington Post. Uh, but uh, I, I don't know. One of the things that really concerns me, Brian, is, you know, you're not old enough, but during the, during the 30s, when, when Hitler was under so much attack in this country, there were people who said, now look, let's wait a minute. Maybe Hitler's got something. Maybe he has a just cause against the Versailles Treaty, which treated... Germany unfairly. I ask you, where is there a noted newspaper correspondent in this country who has said, with respect to Yugoslavia, the breakup of Yugoslavia, or Bosnia, who has said, let's wait a minute, let's look at some of these facts. I mean, some of the facts th that I have put into this book. I don't know of a single American newspaper man, noted newspaper man, who has asked that critical question. Nobody wants to look at the issues. Everybody wants to, to dwell on what is happening there now. And who is killing whom? And they're all, they're all, uh, all guilty of atrocities. Croats, Serbs, Muslims, they're all guilty of, of atrocities. But where is there, uh, I have, uh, you know, I've tried to write op-ed pieces. I've written many to the New York Times, to the Washington Post, to the Christian Science Monitor, uh, to the Wall Street Journal. And I think with one exception, they were all turned down. And why? they dealt, I don't know why, they, were, they dealt with the issues. And I've said, I've always asked, let's get at the issues. Nobody wants to talk about the issues. Everybody wants to, to say uh, what's happening there now and who's at fault. Are you perceived as being pro-Sir? Yes, I am. And I don't, and I don't really think that I am. I, let, me, let me say this. I don't care who would do a history of Yugoslavia. I don't think anybody who does an objective history of Yugoslavia, no matter what his background, can come out, but what that history will look rather favorable as far as the Serbs are concerned. Are people's emotions tied to the fact that the Serbs are the ones that are doing the ethnic cleansing? Or? Well, I think that certainly has been uh, part of the problem. For one thing, the media wants to make foreign policy for the United States, and that, I think, has shaped people's attitudes a great deal. Because, look, at, at Kosovo, where the Albanians uh, practiced ethnic cleansing against the Serbs for decades. Nobody seems to say anything about that. Uh, the Croats practiced ethnic cleansing against the Serbs in World War II, and even now, in 1991, in, in certain areas of Croatia, Serbian villages have been completely cleansed. Serbs have been completely thrown out, or killed, or imprisoned. Nobody seems to... Uh, to deal with that. Everybody seems to think, well, somehow the Serbs are the only, only ones guilty of ethnic cleansing. They're all guilty of, of some of these atrocities. Is there a difference between the way the Democrats think on this issue and the way the Republicans think? Well, <laughs> I, I, it doesn't seem like. One of the things that, I, uh, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't mind saying this. Uh, I was a, a New Deal Democrat. I was a, historically, my whole life has been that of a Democrat. And one of the things that puzzled me in, 19, uh, <clears throat> in 1992 is why would my Democrats, my Democratic leaders, accept and follow a failed Republican policy? I, I, really, I really don't understand it. Uh, 
Governor Clinton during the campaign was out uh, with anti-Serb statements and uh, nobody in that, and, and I think this is, and this is true also of Vice President Gore, people in his office somehow perceive the Serbs as the only ones at fault. And I, I really, they don't seem to want to get at the issues. The issues are not important, it seems. Do you have any, again, any notion why? <sighs> Scads of people have asked me that question. Not only here, but people who've, who have visited from Europe. How do you explain <clears throat> American policy? Why, don't the, why doesn't the American administration want to look into the causes? It, what the Serbs are doing, are they doing it simply because they're nasty people? Are there some reasons? Or this business of somehow uh, <clears throat> Serbs have captured two-thirds of Bosnia-Herzegovina, or 70%, as if these Serbs had no business being there. These people, as, as Lord Owen, who worked with, uh, with Secretary Vance to, to get out some, some plan to resolve this thing, has said, look, the Serbs have been there for, for centuries. Before any fighting began in Serbia, in, in Bosnia-Herzegovina, the Serbs uh, were on more than 60% of the land. And yet uh, the media seems to distort that, doesn't even want to look at the issues. I know this is hard at this vantage point, but what do you think is going to happen over the long haul over there? Well, over the long haul, some resolution of some differences inevitably will have to be made. These people, Serbs, Croats, Slovenes, their, their neighbors, they're going to have to work out we, means of, of living together. The Slovenes are already seeking some ways of... Uh, the, the Slovenes were very successful during, uh, during, uh, uh, during the 19... Uh, 70s, particularly 1970s, very successful in that their firms, their businesses had <clears throat> branches all over Serbia, for example. They were good businessmen, better, better than the Serbs, better than the Croats, and they are now uh, cut off from that, but they are putting out some feelers now for somehow uh, <clears throat> providing some accommodation. And I think that eventually they'll have to have some accommodation. Now, unfortunately, this tragic uh, civil war, the conflict, is sim simply made it very difficult and, and probably uh, it's not going to be easy but eventually they have to here's what the book looks like alex n dragnich is the author and uh, it's in your bookstores or can be ordered and the paperback comes out in may book written in 1992 serbs and croats thank you very much for joining us you're welcome